The, the title of this paper is, as you'd know from the, from the uh, conference, is The Thought of Stupefaction, or Event and Decision as Non-Ontological and Pre-Political Factors in the Work of, of Deleuze and Badiou. And I've got uh, two, two epigraphs with which to begin. The first one's from Giorgio Gambon, and uh, he's talking about the word studium. He says, it goes back to an ST or an SP route indicating a crash, the shock of impact. Studying and stupefying are in this sense akin. Those who study are in the situation of people who have received a shock and are stupefied by what has struck them, unable to grasp it and at the same time powerless to leave hold. The scholar, that is, is always stupid. End of quote. So it's the first epigraph from Agamben. The second one's from uh, uh, Samuel Beckett. Ham says, what's happening? And Clough responds, something is running its course. End of quote. Now, I just want to begin by talking a little more about this stupefaction, because I think that the, one of the first problems that arises when confronting a genuine philosopher is that he or she must at least initially stupefy you. You must not know how to respond. If a philosopher has truly introduced you to something new, then the existing received distinctions with which you think will be, by definition, incapable of treating the intervention adequately, at best reducing it to the procrustean bed of what is. Yet if you simply respond to the intervention with uncritical assent, then you also fail the argumentative conditions for philosophy, perhaps even succumbing to a kind of enthusiasm. Philosophy will be rational or it will not be, but if it seeks to reimpose established rationality at every cost, it will also not be. So the problem of this being stuck in the middle is um, also to say that, uh, despite what uh, uh, Mark said before, the event is not always simply to come, but also always already gone, vanished less than reality. But, and in fact, you can also probably typologise uh, uh, philosophers vis-a-vis -vis their uh, uh, attention to the event. In this, um, I'm going to just invoke this, this isn't in the written paper, but there's a Japanese psychiatrist called Kimura Bin. He has a sort of psychopathology of the event. If you come after the event, you're a melancholic. You spend your life running through the history, your history going, where was my event? When did I come to be? Where, could, where, where was I? And of course, you never find it. That's the melancholic temperament. Now, the schizophrenic hasn't yet got to their own party. He's running around going, where's my party? Where's my party? Where's the event at which I'm meant to arrive? Then there's two ways of actually turning up at your party. Um, they're not as good as they sound. The first one, the first one is, um, Obsessional neurosis, where you wash your hands over and over again, for instance. Am I, I am at my party, I am at my party. It's another one. Or the final one, which uh, Kamura Bin himself refers to as the originary landscape of psychosis, is um, epilepsy, which, strangely enough, where you actually do turn up at your own party and it's so much fun that you actually tap out and you're no longer there. So these are the four ways of failing to be at the event, which must, and I, I presume we all fall into one of these psychopathological philosophical accounts. But the thing that I've met, I, I above all want to emphasise is this thought of stupefaction. I really believe this, and I also want to, to emphasise this as one of the things that always irritates me in the commentaries on great philosophers, where they simply become commentary, exegesis, and in fact thereby fail the test of super, stupefaction, as if you could continue to go along simply commenting in a grand old style or according to received notions about someone whose entire... Um, Oeuvre and, uh, and um, Canatus, I suppose, has been about derailing you from, these, uh, uh, from, from your, your existing routines. And I think that's something that needs to be emphasised with both Deleuze explicitly and Badiou also explicitly, and why not Whitehead as well. So I, I just want to uh, underline this. There's a, a lot more to be said about stupefaction, but above all, it means that we have to be very careful about the ways in which we attend to, attend to philosophy and try and represent uh, uh, the philosophers with whom we deal. Very simply, I think we cannot proceed according to existing categories and philosophical methodologies, simply by imminent exegesis, simply through compare and contrast, as people are now doing again and again with Deleuze and Badiou. Um, either the, the establishment of a third way, which for both Badiou Jew and Deleuze is, is unthinkable precisely because it um, entails the routines of mediation against which both of them are, are, are both of them like are, are po polemicised quite fervently. Or finally, even methodological suspension. I don't know what we're doing. Um, let's just wait and see. Let's just hover around in these texts in, with uh, infinite patience until somehow we can, um, you know, maybe find a way to get to get through. Because of course. Um, I think I mentioned this to a couple of people before. Um, you might be in the situation of Buridan's ass, which, as you know, it's a famous scholastic uh, paradox. Starving ass wanders into a barnyard, two equally appealing bales of hay in front of him. Um, 
There's no criteria whatsoever for distinguishing between these bales. And of course, the ass drops dead trying to make a decision which one, the one on the left, the one on the right, and dies. So you simply just can't hang around hoping that something's going to happen or some you know, divine afflatus is going to strike. What, what uh, Oliver and I want to then do today is say, is say a number of things. And um, we're, we're going to, uh, of course, given the, the themes of this conference, isolate a key concept, the event. This isolation is going to be, involve a situating of the conditions that impel a return to such a concept, of a situation for thought in which the necessity to think what an event might be has to be seized as a task. It sounds probably too Benjaminian, but there we are. On a basis of an outline of the situation, we want to talk about how the thought of the event at once emerges from a problematic in which language is the threshold for such a thought and yet cannot, qua language, prove an adequate ground for such thought. As we'll see, both Deleuze and Badiou are forced to engage with a problematic of language in order to rethink the event, albeit in radically different ways, but also radically similar ways too. In doing so, we're going to talk about some of the problems each has in thinking the event, and finally, we're going to speak very briefly, I think, but very importantly and incisively about the, um, what, what their thought has, the consequences their thought has for any thought of the political. Above all, one of the things I want to underline is the event is not simply a concept for both philosophers, but a name for that itch of unreason that stupefies thought, that forces thought to a standstill, demanding new forms of thinking which themselves cannot be resolved except at the cost of inconsistency. In fact, if Deleuze and Badiou's strength is substantially due to their willingness to grapple anew with the exigencies of the event, in their attempts to think it, the event drives them ever further into their own stupefying difficulties that force, in turn, further essays of thought that further multiply the, dif uh, the difficulties. I'm now going to turn, that's just the basic intro, the stupefaction, and now something about the situation. This is a very broad, uh, broad outline of why thinkers like Deleuze and Badiou, Derrida and so on might have turned to the, uh, the event. This, the, the account I'm giving, as I say, is very, very simple, but it's just going to serve to sort of establish a couple of uh, points of reference. The, the situation of, of thought with, in which these people uh, start to work, 1960s France, is, um, is, is trying to, I think, de-theologize thought radically, and it finds itself forced to do so in a very particular philosophical conjuncture. We're going to characterise the situation as a knot of legacies and opacities. Above all, Heidegger's thought of the event and language as the house of being. Hegel is delivering the problem of becoming considered in terms of negation. And Saussure's conception of language as a diacritical system of differences to provide the only scientific or the best scientific model for a systematic thought of, sim of systems. So these three sort of like very, very unfortunately reduced pointers. Now, the emergence of the contemporary uh, French thought of the event is bound up with the struggle to escape the force field of these legacies. Indeed, even in the, the preface to, to uh, Difference and Repetition, Deleuze himself uh, may make some of the, uh, some of the similar signposts. Posts. Now, all of these thinkers, uh, Foucault, Lyotard, Derrida, Deleuze and Guattari, Badiou and so on, um, they find Heidegger overwhelming. His elaboration of the destiny of being as rupture and continuity in its very specific sense, it's a crucial resource for the diagrammatic reconstruction of heterogeneous discourses. I mean, Foucault himself often says, you know, for me, Heidegger's always been the, the essential philosopher, despite my apparent, um, you know, my Foucault's apparent um, enthusiasm for, for Nietzsche above all. So they find Heidegger overwhelming. They cannot be happy with his characterization of being, nor with his politics. They also all recognise the crucial need to rethink becoming, to conceptualise how change can occur in situations a la Hegel, but outside of any dynamic provided by Hegel's logic of negation. They also finally recognise that Saussure has enabled a new and powerful thought of variant institutional structures, but that he also thereby confirms language as institution, as the very paradigm of institution, and in doing so, reduces difference to bundles of oppositions. So, this means that the, the, the situation in which the, the thinkers we're, we're speaking about, they find themselves having to confront conceptions of being, the logics of negation, the primacy of language as the model of institution itself. And again, in line with our, this, this theme of stupefaction, as no existing techniques, methods or concepts will do, these will have to be invented. And the exposition will have to take on the reconstruction of the concept of the event as an integral part of its presentation. The event, in doing so, must be distinguished from accident on the one hand and essence on the other, which also requires thinking the status of chance and of contingency, of, of, of the absolutes and of different, uh, different modalities of such.
So, and chance and contingency not being the same. If one takes as an entrance point for this reconstruction the relationship between the event and the institution, there's three different moments that we want to um, identify in contemporary French philosophy. And these moments are not chronological. In fact, they sometimes appear within one and the same text. Um, I'm just going to, I don't really have time to go into them. You'll see this in the, in the, in the, the major paper. But the, the three problems are the problems of thinking, firstly, multiplicity, difference, repetition against institutions considered in their broadest sense as regional forces of, in, of unification, i.e. the event against, against structure. Secondly, then, the problem of the centrality of the event as opposed to its consideration as a marginal or supplemental moment in the elaboration of an ontology. So the first one, event against institution. The second problem about putting the event, what happens when you place the event directly at the centre of your thinking rather than dealing with it on the way or as a byproduct of ontology. Um, and finally, then, the problem itself of the constructability of the event, of the constructible reality of the event, of constructing a concept that can, of the event that can once account for the eventing of this, uh, this event and the continuing um, uh, staying with the event, how not to give way on the, on the event that might, 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 have, um, might seem to have vanished, how, how does one still remain faithful to that event in, in Badiou's own terms. Now, the challenges, as a, you know, the attempt, this attempt to rethink the event is so difficult that in doing so, I think there, um, in attempting to come to terms with it, it threatens to render thought itself inconsistent. And the challenges are so great, one might even suggest that the attempt to construct a conce concept of the event ends by having to construct a new concept of concept and not being able to do so adequately. Now, precisely for the reasons uh, we've mentioned, language has tended to function as one of the guiding threads of the program. And it's with this thread in hand, that of language, I'm now going to uh, turn to Deleuze specifically. Now, Deleuze, Deleuze's thought constitutes from beginning to end a sequence of experiments about the problem of the event, sense, difference, expression and univocity. Even in such early work as uh, his review of Jean Hippolyte's Logique, existence. Deleuze emphasises that if ontology is possible, it is not an ontology of essence or of man, but of sense. So from very, very early on, Deleuze is already uh, attending to sense. Um, it's by way of radicalisation of the sense of sense, that is, as extra ontological becoming, that Deleuze's works of the 60s pursue a theory of the event, most explicitly in his magnificent text from 1969, The Logic of Sense. Now, what, what Deleuze is attempting in his works of this period is nothing less than a resumption of classical philosophy, as Badiou himself puts it, perhaps even in, if in the guise of its opposite. Yet if, as Badiou also claims, one of the crucial aspects of Deleuze's work is the latter's evasion of the linguistic turn, although Badiou himself can't really decide how much, how caught up in language is Deleuze. And in fact, the, the history of commentary really is split on this question. Deleuze himself seems at some times to, to, to marginalise it. At other times, he places it implicitly at the centre of his thought. And correspondingly, the, uh, the, the tradition of interpretation of Deleuze can't quite place how important or where language should fit in this, um, in Deleuze's programme. And and Badiou himself is kind of flip-flops on the, on the question. I think it's a, a key question for reasons I'm about to uh, explicate. Um, perhaps the case is, as, as Jean-Jacques Le Cirque puts it in an excellent account, quote, Deleuze is an integral part of the linguistic turn that characterises classical French theory. But the paradox is that he is also the heir of a tradition of, if not downright hostility to language, at least deep distrust, end of quote. Perhaps the simplest way to deal with this is simply, by, is simply to say, Deleuze attempts to construct a theory of the event by passing through language itself. In this regard, the logic of sense is a foundational text. It's interested still in philosophical foundations in a way that Deleuze uh, later rejects or at least deliberately complicates. One should also note that this book, which Deleuze himself called a psychoanalytical novel, and not, I'm really angry with this, a psychological novel, as it's given in the English translation, which is an absolute abomination, given um, there's a big difference between psychology and psychoanalysis, and for the translator to simply replace psychoanalytical by psychological, not only, um, not only is, a, is a terrible error, but it also mis, uh, misdirects people's readings of that text, and precisely around the question of the relationship 
to language and psychoanalysis, which in uh, France itself at the time is, as you know, dominated, at least for the philosophical scene, by Lacan. And also in that text, uh, The Logic of Sense, Deleuze is also very uh, involved with the, with the, the English school and, and particularly Melanie Klein's uh, forms of object relations. So to reduce or negate this from the very, very beginning already shows that people are failing to read just how important language is. That mistranslation is not just a, 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 part, a, a sort of party political program, um, but it's also a, a misreading of the, it shows a misreading of the, of the text. Um, the other thing, um, in fact, I think the, the, the book engages in a radicalisation of the famous Lacanian distinction between statements and utterance, i.e. in Lacan, this is an insistence on the irreducibility of a cleavage within any act of discourse itself. And in fact, Deleuze radicalises this, it seems to me. Note too, the form of logic of sense, the logic of sense then properly, it's advisable, I say advisable advisedly, to take account of its form, the length and distribution of chapters, their titles, not to mention the relations forged within each chapter between traditional philosophical reference, literary developments and logical argumentation. As we shall see, this deformation of philosophical presentation is itself a work of philosophical ethics. And that's something, once again, to come back to something, the stupefaction, the way in which these people are proceeding is absolutely integral. It's itself has a, a conceptual, uh, un uncircumventable conceptual loading. Take, for instance, the very first entry in the book. It's entitled, First Series of Paradoxes of Pure Becoming. The first here designates at least three things. First, that it's indeed the first entry in the book, it's the first series. Second, that there will be more than one series in the book, of which this is an, the inaugural series. Thirdly, that each chapter is itself has been re-denominated by Deleuze a series and not a chapter. It's not a chapter of a book, it's a series in a, in a text of some kind. The, in fact, the, the, this has already taken us to the second word, series, which itself becomes a concept in the course of the book's elaboration. So this inexorable movement from first to second word already leads us towards something at which we, may, we have, may not have yet arrived, that is, to the movement of sense itself, because there's a movement of sense in Deleuze, as you know. As for the paradoxes which are spoken of in this title, here they're notably plural, they're not, they're not singular. We shall find that paradox is one privileged way in which sense itself can be exposed as the expressed of a proposition. And the adjective pure is also crucial, as is the gerund becoming. But, as these, but these cannot really be meaningful until the book has been read and reread. And there's also some sort of injunction, it seems to me, to reread these series rather than simply read them. In fact, it's probably, probably in my opinion, no, it's impossible to read. Reading is, is the impossible. You can either not read or you can reread, but there's no actual act of reading. Um, now, the text proper proceeds to, uh, opens with a very suggestive opposition between um, Lewis Carroll's uh, purveying of nonsense in um, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and, the, um, and Plato's distinction between measured things and unlimited becomings. From there, Deleuze goes on to discuss uh, stoic logic and ontology, contemporary linguistics, absurd and impossible objects, Lacan, Levi Strauss, Aeon and Kronos, Mallarmé, nonsense, good sense and common sense, Artaud, Husserl, Leibniz, among much else. So it's, it's quite a crazy... If, it, if you really read this book, it's quite a crazy book. It's like already... Um, it's already doing a number of things which really are not um, uh, in the classical philosophical manner. Now, this linking of the disparate is itself a procedure, and tracing its details leads us into the dark arcana of Deleuze's thought. In the section entitled Third Series of the Proposition, Deleuze establishes the basis of his theory. Deleuze, like the Stoics, is interested here in the proposition as the basic element of language and identifies three distinct relations within the proposition. These are firstly denotation, second manifestation and thirdly signification. Denotation for um, Deleuze functions with representations and images which are held to represent a state of affairs. Its paradigm case are indexicals, its ruling criterion the true and false distinction. Manifestation by contrast trust, concerns the utter of the proposition. It's quote presented as a statement of desires and beliefs which correspond to this proposition. End of quote. Its paradigm case is the eye and its criterion veracity and illusion. Finally, signific signification concerns universal and general concepts and their proper syntactic articulation. It establishes general truth conditions which are differentiated not from falsity or illusion, as in the case of the first two. Um, sets, but from what would be absurd. So Deleuze says, uh, it seems to me essentially in a proposition, every proposition can be considered under the heading of denotation, manifestation or signification. 
that, and that is irreducible. Those differences are irreducible and what, whichever uh, approach one takes, one's going to miss something essential about the other two for, for reasons I'm uh, uh, about to explicate. In fact, one basic aspect of, of Deleuze's procedure is that he's concerned with which of these relations, he starts to ask the question, which of these relations is primary? He, he's thus pursuing a general and systematic inquiry into the grounds of language considered as sets of propositions. Uh, first of all, uh, and again, propositions, not judgments. His arguments are designed to show that not one of these relations suffices as primary in every case. For example, if in the order of speech the ally is foundational, in this order, significations for Deleuze are not strictly speaking significations at all, for they're thereby ultimately deployed only as fodder for manifestation for the expression of beliefs and desires. If one takes um, language as primary, the system of language itself, then significations come into their own, but once one's done that, denotation becomes compromised, representations of states of affairs being reduced to the legitimacy of their implication and not being taken in their reference. At the same time, the phantom of denotation splits signification. For instance, premises have to be affirmed as true, i.e. as adequately representing states of affairs, which then entails that signification cannot entirely be implicative or tautological or entirely syntactic, since it has to have some sort of referential moment in it. So you can see, I mean, I'm moving much too quickly, but this is the way it seems to me that Deleuze sets up that book. First of all, language, the proposition, these three sets of, uh, these three types of propositions, they're all heterogeneous. None of them are able to function as the foundation for any of the others. And in fact, they imply their others as well. So we already have within um, language itself and within any propositional act, like this, this bursting heterogeneity, which Deleuze starts by basically um, trying to, to emphasise. But because, as I say, it's also a foundational inquiry, um, he's, he's interested in what, what, what's going to be primary in, 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 uh, among propositions. Not only for Deleuze are none of these relations capable of grounding one another, but none of them are capable of functioning without one another. The manifestation of beliefs and desires would be impossible without concepts, for instance. So here's Deleuze. From denotation to manifestation, then to signification, but also from signification to manifestation and to denotation, we are carried along a circle, which is the circle of the proposition. End of quote. In order to break this closed circle and ground the proposition, Deleuze is compelled to add a fourth relation to this list, that of sense. This is where sense and the event uh, emerge for Deleuze. Sense for Deleuze is a non-existent entity which can only present itself as paradox and nonsense. Um, it's essential to note Deleuze never explicitly defines this term as such. It's just he, he deploys it rather. It can mean that one senses meaning, direction. He plays on the, the pol pol polyvalence of it without ever admitting its equivocity. And the very nomination, sense, is therefore polemical, not only directed against such dualisms as the intelligible and the sensible, but against what he calls the more profound and secret platonic dualism of limited things opposed to a pure becoming without measure. Deleuze then argues that sense cannot be reduced to any of the other relations, but must be, and this is a very important quote, both the expressible or the expressed of the proposition and the, and the attribute of the state of affairs. We will not ask, therefore, what is the sense of the event. The event is sense itself. The event belongs essentially to language. Underline essentially, it has an essential relationship to language. End of quote. Sense thus comes to function for Deleuze as providing a non-foundational foundation for all the other relations in the proposition. Uh, how much time? Have got six minutes. All right, I'm going to I'm going to skip the best bit. Um, the, that one makes of the, no sense. It makes no sense. <laughs> We've just seen an, ev an event has just taken place, Henry. The, not a very big one or a good one, but an event. The, given that, um, for, uh, and Deleuze emphasises, again, I, I, start, I, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, um, the movement of sense itself, the, just the very stupid fact that um, language is itself sequential and has to be sequential in some ways, that at the beginning of a sentence, you really never know where it's going to end up. Like, and you really don't. And so one of the things that the movement, this is almost for, for Deleuze an incredibly, you know, pragmatic aspect of the movement of sense is that, is that 
you don't know where is, you don't know where I, I don't know where I'm going when I'm speaking. Although I might think that I know where I'm going when I'm speaking, I didn't know that I was going to say that while I was speaking. And so you can see that sense is already divagating. It's not yet. And as soon as the the sentence is over, well, it's the express to the proposition. It exists nowhere. It's already over. It's already always already to come. It's already already uh, always already over. And it's also always implied in the very act of speaking, in the movement of sense that carries along all the other relations of the proposition. So there's something very simple and analytic, it seems to me, about Deleuze, which has also been um, mystified in a lot of the secondary commentary. It's a very, very simple, stu like stupid, stupefying aspect of the, the uh, of lang uh, language pragmatics, perhaps. And, and that's, um, this is one reason why the event never is, but is always becoming. The proposition's never the last or final proposition. Its entire sense will be altered by the addition of further propositions. And yet this sense can never be said as such. There, there is no meta-language, to, to put it another way. It can only be expressed. Its incorporeal subsistence can therefore be most fully shown in paradoxes and nonsense, which open up new zones of problems for thought, but without necessarily passing through any activity of questioning, which tends to take interrogative forms driving towards denotation, manifestation or signification. Uh, it's not that Deleuze is against asking questions, of course. It's simply that um, it's simply that the opening up of new zones of problems for thought is not necessarily identified with the question of being has today been forgotten, for instance. There's already, a, again, an implicit polemical reference. In Deleuze's point is basically this. Paradox and nonsense are ineradicable and insistent features of propositions which, even as they may conform to all criteria of denotation, manifestation and signification, are nonetheless irreducible to such criteria and cannot be satisfactorily explained or explained away by, or neutralised by any recourse to the true, the veracious or truth conditions. And paradoxes, and this is why uh, Deleuze has an uh, enthusiasm for nominalism, they present serious difficulties to the thought of universals. For instance, uh, his, one of his key um, references is the, paradox, uh, the problem of infinite regress. And this, in fact, can be verified historically in the key role that paradoxes have played in philosophical inspiration from, um, from, the, from the origins in Gre uh, ancient Greece, and, and in fact, the cynics is, uh, is one, along with the Stoics, is one of Deleuze's um, key references, all the way to, to Russell and Gödel. And not only can paradoxes not be simply excluded by logicians, but paradoxes practically give rise to entirely new enterprises within thought. And in, in the set theory paradoxes, for instance, which are so important in the development of set theory, but also for, for Badiou as well in, in, um, in his theory of the undecidable and, and, and what, what the, the consequences that might be for rethinking the event in philosophy. So such paradoxes clearly also serve a crucial pedagogical function for philosophy, which, on Deleuze's description, does not transmit itself by way of a promulgation of doctrine, but precisely through unhinging good and common sense. And this again directs us to the problematic of stupefaction. Deleuze's own propositional calculus thus situates itself fully in the cynical and stoic and scholastic tradition of logical analysis and teaching. Not simply anti-Platonic in its sidelining of axiomatic mathematics, it's also anti-Aristotelian in so far as it junks the primacy of predicate logic, and anti-Hegelian in so far as the emergence of sense as the expressed of propositions is meant to be entirely affirmative and not like a uh, reducible to, a, to a, a, a logic of the negation of the negation. Um, mm. um, I'm going to be very quick. I'm going to have to reduce it to two propositions now. So if the event is extra ontological, subjective and political, uh, necessarily given that it only um, it, it cannot be reduced to the, the relations, uh, the propositional relations, it's eminently ethical and again in the pedagogical, stupefying way I spoke of before. Um, this is why you can say it's not Humpty Dumpty himself, the stoic master. On the other hand, what, what's the relationship to politics? And this is where I'm going to, I'm going to conclude on a, on a dissatisfactory note of, of irresolution, which is going to be uh, thoroughly resolved by, by Oliver in my wake. And the, the, the point that I simply want to make is none of the commentators, none of the, the very like authoritative commentators on Deleuze and the political can actually can agree in the slightest about what actually is the politics for Deleuze. Is he a political thinker? Is he a thinker of politics? Does he really have anything to do with politics at all? And all of these very reputable authorities um, are completely at odds. Not only are they completely at odds in the sense of a, a tradition usually um, uh, produces uh, variations which can't be reconciled, but I want to, uh, and Oliver wants to make the, the point that there's something volatile about 
Deleuze's text itself, which makes it impossible for you to decide one way or the other significantly. And this is completely integral to the way in which he thinks the event. There's, so it's not just a, a failure of the commentators or a simple uh, taking of positions or an attempt or disagreements about interpretation. There's actually something inherent in the volatility, and it's a directed sim, uh, uh, volatility of Deleuze's work, which makes it impossible, literally impossible, to stabilise any, uh, any opinion about the political uh, uh, Chez Deleuze. The, Okay, I'm going to. I'm just going to finish with this. Deleuze's theory of the event and, uh, with a recapitulation. It's initially derived from his confrontation with the theory of language. This language is pragmatic, logical, systematic, and consistent. At least if one accepts Deleuze's starting point in regards to denotation, manifestation, and signification, the event must be extra personal, ontologi extra ontological, and extra conceptual in its own terms. It's also ethical in the peculiar form that he assigns to it. Yet, it's also important to say that he himself is not altogether satisfied with this attempt. In fact, he, he sort of makes vague gestures of, 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 of uh, repudiation of his own earlier work. And he returns to, yes, he returns to it throughout his work under a swarm of different names, and indeed by attempting to rupture with language by turning to other interlocutors and other fields. And I'm going to uh, end on that note of irresolution. So thank you very much. How do we know that there are two concepts of the event between Badiou and Deleuze? Because we have two proper names? The event is said in multiple ways in Deleuze and Badiou, according to ontology, causality, frequency, temporality, language, identity, and unity or multiplicity. Each of these ways is a category of the event, and in every single category we find contrary Deleuzean and Badusian propositions. This is the voice of Doxa. It differentiates Badiou and Deleuze in seven orthodox claims, one for each category. Claim one, concerning ontology. For Badiou, the event is excluded from the field of ontology, forming a point of impossibility for set theory, whereas for Deleuze, the event is the ultimate term of his ontology, the name of being. Claim two, concerning causality. For Badiou, the event is a punctual cause without being an effect, since it has no origin. Whereas for Deleuze, following his adoption of a stoic ontology, the event is an effect, a host of effects, without being a cause. Claim three, concerning frequency. For Badiou, the event is rare, occurring only in very particular situations. Whereas for Deleuze, the event is ubiquitous, and omnipresent. Claim four of temporality. For Deleuze, the event has its own temporal register, that of aeon, of an infinitely divisible past and future. And so the event has always already happened and remains to come. For Badiou, in contrast, the event creates a new expanded present and belongs to no originary situation or temporal register, being materially inscribed solely in the situation in which it occurs. Claim five of language. Deleuze anchors his conception of the event in the Stoic philosophy of language, in the particular dimension of the proposition and in structuralism. Badiou, on the other hand, seeks to break with structuralism's positing of a primacy of language over existence and attempts to think the structure of the event independently of language. Claim six of identity. In Deleuze's thought, the event has no predicable identity. Rather, it destabilizes such identity. The event in Badiou does have a particular identity, being constituted partially of elements of an eventual site in a situation. Claim seven concerning unity and multiplicity. The ultimate destination of the affirmative thought of the event for Deleuze is the thought that there is one sole and same event in which all events communicate. In Badiou's philosophy of conditions, disparate events remain disparate, particular and multiple. There is no overarching event. These seven orthodox claims, in turn, ground themselves in the global comparison of Deleuze and Badiou in terms of their projects. 
Deleuze's project is to show how structuralism constitutes an epochal moment in the history of thought in that it elaborates a theory of sense that frees sense from its overdetermination in Kantian or Husserlian transcendental philosophy by the forms of good sense and common sense. Badiou's project, on the other hand, is to develop a post-Marxist theory of structural change that is compatible with a mathematical ontology and can model the emergence of new knowledge in fields as diverse as art, politics, science, and love. However, if we read logic of sense and being an event closely, it becomes evident that these two philosophers in their different projects share the same problematic. And that is the problematic of how to rescue the event that was on That is the problematic of how to rescue the event from its status as an accident. Without, without turning the event into an essence. An accident, in Aristotelian terms, is an external attribute of a substance. It's often relative to the point of view from which the substance is perceived. My house was built by Callias. Callias is a house builder, but he's also musical. Callias' musicality, for Aristotle, not for me, is accidental to the building of the house. Moreover, the house may be defined, it may come into Logos without mention of Callias' musicality. Thus, essence is indifferent to accidents. But not only do these two philosophers share the same problematic, thinking the event neither as accident nor as essence, they share the same strategy, which is quite simply that of making the event last, finding ways of expanding and ex extending its very happening and coming to pass, preventing the event from instantly disappearing, transforming its ephemerality into ongoing impact. Now, if these two philosophers share a problematic and a general strategy, then surely their tactics differ. But this is where we have to enter into the details. I will identify four tactics for making the event last. And I will start with Deleuze's tactics, contrast Badiou's, and then start overlapping them. So the first tactic is to divide the ideality of the event from its spatio-temporal actualization. This is one of Deleuze's explicit tactics in the logic of sense. The effect of such a division is to guarantee the possible repetition and extension of the event beyond its initial punctual occurrence. That is, in its ideality, the event cannot be exhausted by any of its occurrences. In a strange move for a supposedly anti-Platonic philosopher, Deleuze thus generates an autonomy of the event by paradoxically stripping it of its eventhood, its quality of occurring or happening in a particular locality. But for Deleuze, the event is not just independent ideality, but it is also incarnated in acting and suffering bodies, and thus it is dependent. For Badiou, on the other hand, the event is literally nothing outside its spatio-temporal actualization as a multiple. If it is not named at a particular locality, it appears, he says, so as to disappear. However, in its occurrence within a particular historical situation, an event is strictly divided from a stable registering or representation of its spatio-temporal actualization. That is, for Badiou, a named event is extremely unstable in its identity. It forms a point of opacity and an enigma for what he calls the state of the situation. And thus, hypothetically, an event could be named in different ways. Thus, Badiou, too, divides the event from its actualizations. The event is not the same thing as the named event of an intervention. The second tactic of making the event last is to assign the event to an independent ontological register. So Deleuze, as we know, develops his own version of a stoic ontology. He separates two realms, the realm of bodies and states of affairs in which bodies act upon each other and suffer each other's actions as causes. And then there is the second realm, 
of events as effects or attributes linguistically indexed in infinitive verbs. The tree is a body and there is an interpenetration of light energy and chlorophyll that leads to the effect, the event, of the tree greening. To green is an event attributed to the body tree. Events are thus not only divided from their particular spatio-temporal real realization in a state of affairs, but they enjoy their own consistent ontological plane, the plane precisely of surfaces. Moreover, the division between bodies and events, or causes and effects, corresponds to two different versions or forms of temporality. The temporality of bodies and their interpenetration is that of chronos, and its dominant mode is that of the indivisible present. The time of events, on the other hand, is that of aeon, characterized by an infinite divisibility of the present into past and future, to the point that there is no present, but a continual communication between the past and the future. Now what this does to the event is transform it from a punctual occurrence into an original envelopment of several stretches of time. And each stretch of time is placed within another, like a series of Russian dolls. Now, at the same time as he constructs this temporal expansion of the event, Deleuze also renders the event equivalent to any process of non-fixed change whatsoever. That is, he renders the event equivalent to becoming. Do we find anything like this tactic, this second tactic in Badju? Well, first of all, the orthodox claim four mentioned earlier was correct. Badiou does not admit any other ontological realm than that of infinite multiples. There are only infinite multiples, and some of them could quite possibly schematize temporal situations, but none of these temporal situations has any privilege concerning other situations. That is, time does not cast a shadow over being. However, within historical situations, an event if it is named, if it generates a generic truth procedure, will constitute an epochal marking of the temporality internal to that particular situation. Moreover, there is a specific temporality of a truth procedure, and that is none other than the future anterior, the, the activity of forcing, which is the, the activity of creating new knowledge of the situation to come, the expanded situation that would welcome the event, the activity of forcing concerns what statements will have been true concerning the new situation. Thus, there's a continual circling in between the past and the future in the activity of uh, forcing, in the elaboration of the effects of the event, in the concrete, contingent, possible expansion of the event. Badiou, too, thus renders the event equivalent to a process of change, but it's to a very particular form of change, inasmuch as a generic truth procedure is nothing other than the continual expansion of the identity of an event, an expansion of its envelopes of consequences throughout the situation. But, again, in contrast to Deleuze's employment of this tactic, the second tactic, Badiou does not grant himself an entire ontological register on which events are immediately and automatically equivalent to change. This is a little like pulling a rabbit out of the hat. But then what is philosophy in Badiou but a guaranteed register for events? Not of every event, but the existence of the register of philosophy is assured. The third tactic employed to make the event last is the simplest and that's you turn the event into the destabilization of structure. Let's start with Badiou this time. The event occurs at a point of the situation, the eventual site, that is already a point of dysfunction and opacity for the state of the situation. None of the site's elements belong to the situation, and thus it is only presented within the situation not represented. Once the event occurs, it joins the elements of that dysfunctional site to a proper name, 
and this duo makes no sense whatsoever for the state. And thus the presentation of the event, the initial presentation of the occurrence of the event for Badiou interrupts the unity of the situation. In Deleuze, the event is also thought in the form of the paradox and nonsense. To be more specific, one of the forms that, the no that nonsense takes is that of a word that says its own sense. Normal words or names for Deleuze possess an independent sense that can be said by other words. One of the rules of signification is thus that names have different degrees and correspond to distinct levels of properties or classes. I quote, each property must be of a type superior to the properties or individuals on which it bears. Thus, this rule of signification can be phrased in Deleuze's own terms as a rule against self-belonging. I cite, a set cannot contain itself as one of its elements. And this is Deleuze speaking, not Badiou. Deleuze speaking a good uh, 19 years before being an event. The structure of the event, qua nonsense, is thus a self-reflexive structure in Deleuze. But then what is this but the very definition of an event in Badiou? A self-reflexive multiple. A, um, an event is, a, um, is defined as itself plus, is defined as a set that constitutes of itself plus the elements of an evental site. And it's precisely this structure which excludes the event from the field of set theory ontology because it constitutes an extraordinary set which leads to Russell's paradox and that's why it has to be prohibited. Finally, the fourth tactic for making the event last. Turn the event into the event of structure. The event can be conceived as the imminent constitution and production of structure. Deleuze identifies the event with what Lacan calls the master signifier, the floating paradoxical element that unites the two series of signifiers and signifieds, and thus forms a structure. To think an event as the event of structure is the post-structuralist solution par excellence to the problem of rescuing the event from its status as an accident. Indeed, this, I hold, this is one of the defining characteristics of post-structuralism. In the inoperative community, Jean-Luc Nancy develops a variation on this theme by arguing that solely the eventual exposure of the groundless being of a community in a moment of what he calls unworking or désouvrement will allow a community to emerge which is not a community of fusion or a self-identical community. Indeed, the inaugural post-structuralist tactic is to isolate an exception to structure, such as the pharmacon for Derrida, and turn it into the condition of possibility and impossibility of structure. Deleuze, for, for instance, places nonsense as not just an exception to the laws of sense, but also as generative of sense. I quote, nonsense operates a donation of sense. End quote. When I first started reading Being an Event, I expected Badiou to employ precisely this tactic, to identify the event, this supplement, with the very constitution of structure. But he doesn't. He explicitly avoids identifying the structural term the exceptional structural term which is the suture of the situation to being or the void, he avoids identifying this with the eventual site or with the event. So you've got three different terms. You've got the void of the situation, which is the paradoxical term which um, names the being of the situation, the inconsistent multiplicity of the situation. You've got the eventual site and then you've got the event and they are not conflated. They're quite separate in his constitution. And this is something that... Uh, both Justin and I um, have uh, realised forms a point of opacity in the commentary surrounding Badiou because a lot of people conflate them. So one can say that the result of this investigation is very simple. Deleuze is a post-structuralist, Badiou isn't. However, again, there are traces of the post-structuralist solution in Badiou's own thinking. He says that the event momentarily interrupts the situation's count for one and exposes its being as inconsistent multiplicity. 
this I hold is one of the traces of Jean-Luc Nancy's thought in Badiou's thought. Where Badiou and Deleuze come closest is in a fifth supplementary tactic, which does not pull a rabbit out of the hat. In fact, it does precisely the opposite. I call it the imminent local expansion of events, and Deleuze calls it the communication of events. He says that events communicate insofar as a divergence of series is affirmed in what he calls a disjunctive synthesis. One, a synthesis which does not efface the difference of the series, but explicitly activates and emphasizes their distance. I apologize for, because I'm going very quickly, I'm not actually elaborating what the concept series means, but remember that series can refer to a series of acts of eating, a series of acts of speaking, it can refer to a series of signifiers, a series of signifieds, a series of images. All of these series are what construct the world of Wonderland, for example, in uh, Alice in Wonderland. In Badiou, there is a communication of, there is actually a concept of the communication of events. And if you've all read Infinite Thought, as you should have, in the back, in the interview, um, somebody poses a particularly good question. A, a colleague of ours, Jeff Boucher, poses a particularly good question to ba Badiou and says, aren't you a decisionist? Which is an accusation that Lyotard had already um, made uh, concerning Badiou back in 1989. And... Um, and he really pins Badiou down because Badiou comes out with about three different answers and he actually engages in kettle logic and says at the end, I'm not a decisionist, um, not anymore, uh, which is very ambiguous. But he says that one generic truth procedure or fidelity can lay the ground for another intervention and thus for another event and subsequently another generic truth procedure. And his example is Lenin's fidelity to the events of the Paris Commune. This is what allows Lenin to intervene and to name the event of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Moreover, Deleuze and Badiou come together with this tactic because for Deleuze, events communicate through opening up onto what he calls an infinity of predicates. Indeed, for Deleuze, there are two ways in which personal identity is lost in the communication of events. And infinite identity is the first. Now, what this corresponds to in Badiou's thought is the generic nature of what he calls the generic multiple. The generic multiple, which is the set theory schema, the set theory multiple, which schematizes the entire process of change, the entire becoming of a generic truth procedure. The generic multiple has elements that possess every single predicate. It is thus the presentation of an infinity of predicates. The second way in which this personal identity is lost for Deleuze is through the affirmation of the distance between series. And on another level, this explains the instability of the commentary on the political dimension in Deleuze, precisely because philosophy and politics are divergent series, and when one tries to affirm a disjunctive synthesis between the two, one loses personal identity. One loses the identity of Deleuze's philosophy, one loses the identity of Deleuze's commentators. Now this, this affirmation of the distance between series corresponds to the indiscernible nature of the generic multiple in Badiou's thought. Uh, and that is, a generic multiple is indiscernible in that for every single property that one mentions, it has, it possesses an element which does not possess that property. So whenever one says of a generic multiple, it's this or it's that, and one applies a predicate to it, one can always say, well, it's not, it's not exactly that, because some of it doesn't correspond to that, to that um, particular property. In this sense, in a very strict sense, a generic multiple is a disjunctive synthesis. And Badiou's thought can thus be understood in Deleuzean terms as a counter-effectuation of the event. But, but... What one does not find in Badiou, thankfully, is the final step into Deleuze's argument, which passes without explanation from the established imminent communication of events to the existence of one sole and same event in which they all communicate. Now, I just want to pass quickly through a, a trap in uh, Deleuze's thought a trap that's part of post structuralism, a trap that Badiou falls into in his early work, and then he manages to find a way out of it. And it's a trap that I call the genetic temptation, the short circuit 
between prescription and genesis. It's clear that an affirmative synthesis, one of these affirmative disjunctive synthesis, that it's a very precarious and contingent affair. It does not happen all the time. It depends on a very particular orientation of thought. Indeed, Deleuze finds one example at the time, and that's Nietzsche's employment of sickness to generate a point of view on health, and of health to generate a point of view on sickness. So neither sickness nor health are privileged, and each of them affirm their distance from the other. Okay, and ex help explore the, the difference of the other. However, Deleuze then connects the affirmative synthesis to the paradoxical floating element, which, remember, is said to traverse, traverse divergent series and constitute structures by uniting different series. Okay, so he connects this contingent affirmative synthesis to a moment which constitutes structure, the floating paradoxical element. At another point, he argues that the subject of knowledge can only exist insofar as an element emerges that is common to divergent series, an element he calls the X or the person. In other words, there would be no subject of knowledge whatsoever if it were not for the synthesis of divergent series. What thus happens in Deleuze's thought is an oscillation between what I would call a prescriptive moment, he describes an operation of thought that can happen, and a structural or genetic moment. He claims that this operation of thought has to have happened already because otherwise the structure would not exist in the first place. Now, Badiou installs precisely such a short circuit in Thierry du Sujet. In that work, the task for thought is to conceive how a political structure can change through what he calls the historical periodization of the dialectic, which is an incredibly difficult challenge for thought. And then his first move is to say, well, actually, the historical periodization of the dialectic has to have already happened, otherwise we wouldn't have any dialectical structure in the first place. And he does this through a reading of the, uh, the Greek atomists on the Kleinerman. Later in his work, Badiou manages to differentiate global change from the genesis of a situation. And he does this by thinking global change, and this is extremely important, as the supplementation of an already existing situation, not as its constitution. Conclusion. In his most prescriptive mode, Deleuze states that events only communicate in as much as they are counter-effectuated. To counter-effectuate the event is to grasp the event which effectuates itself inside oneself as another individual grafted onto oneself. In other words, the counter-effectuation of an event renders the individual equivalent to the event. Inasmuch as that individual treats all other individuals as events and all other events as individuals. For Badiou, the subject is rendered equivalent to the event inasmuch as it is constituted by a series of investigations into the consequences of the events belonging to a situation. So again, Badeurs, all right? We've got the two thinking in exactly the same way. But, but, the final step, again, in Deleuze's argument, annuls its prescriptive ferocity in a theological move. I cite, I quote, counter-effectuating each event, the actor-dancer extracts the pure event which communicates with all the others, end quote. Badiou himself identifies this as an absolute point of difference between their philosophies in his book Deleuze. However, the, um, and at this point I'm confronted with an absolute difference between Badiou and Deleuze. Well, the only disjunctive synthesis possible at this point, from my point of view, is to indicate the task of philosophy as defined by Badiou, which is to name, identify, and think the occurrence and consequences of disparate contemporary events. The existence, again, of this common discourse philosophy is assured. But whether it's a pure event or not is questionable. I just want to end with a quote from Deleuze, which is the most Badiouzian quote I've found. Badiouzian precisely in that it's a thought which is still missing and still yet to come, I think, in uh, Badiou's own work. Deleuze says, the problem is how can an individual surpass their form and their syntactic link to a world to affirm the universal 
communication of events. Now, this problem is clearly articulated in Deleuze and it's denied or passed over by Badiou, who says subjects are simply constituted by their ability or their inability to surpass their form and affirm an event. Our problem is how to understand this task for thought in a non-melancholic, non-Frankfurt school mode. The Frankfurt school says, how could the masses have desired their own oppression? How and when do they not desire oppression? And I see this as the road taken by anti-Oedipus. Rather, the problem should be understood literally as a how-to, user's manual kind of problem, one of identifying particular material kinds of affirmative disjunctive syntheses. Not Badiou versus Deleuze, not even my temptation, Badeuse, but Badiou and Deleuze, each carried in the other's back, and one of them with long fingernails. Thank you. Especially uh, 
uh, later on and makes that clear in uh, uh, um, process and reality. Namely, uh, it's about experiment. It's about experience. And from, from this side, novelty comes in. It cannot be reasoned before that comes in. So you have kind of opening from both sides. You have kind of that kind of coherence that presupposes one another but cannot be closed at any point. And I think that is where uh, that relationship between ontology and politics somehow arises in white and it is kind of filled in, in a, a kind of connects that never never can be uh, brought to a kind of structure. It's always a point again. I will situate my, my talk around three or four or five quotes, more or less, and, and they are where I think that, that kind of relationship will, will pop up. The first one is, and it's kind of amazing for me, it was amazing for me to read that again and see it just right there, how central it became provided at a certain point in the ventures of ideas when Whitehead was talking about uh, the vast difference uh, between ancient and modern uh, political theories and uh, states that we differ from the ancients under one premise on which they were all agreed. Slavery was the presupposition of political theorists then. And he uh, adds freedom is the presupposition of political theorists now. So it's really about that point of slavery. That's, that's really the point where it comes down. And the interesting point here is that he recognizes that in, you know, it seems to be a dualism between that time and this point, a kind of period that it's not that easy, that uh, it is actually a, a very uh, complicated set uh, of presuppositions that are un not undisputed at any time. So slavery is not undisputed and freedom is not undisputed and they are kind of uh, presupposing in a certain sense one another at all times with certain different effects in different cultures. Now why did mentions further that the chief factor in producing this divide between that, that slavery is presupposition for all and freedom is actually not any theory, it's not any thought, it's not stuff, something that, that can be um, that can be reckoned with, in a sense, but it is a revolutionary process. He says it is, the chief factor is, the skeptical humanitarian movement in the 18th century, of which Voltaire and Rousseau were among the chief exponents with the French Revolution as culmination. He's talking about the event of this revolution as being actually a deciding factor, not something that can be reckoned with, although it can, in a sense, you can see retrospectively how it came up, you, you can kind of uh, uh, reckon with this, uh, with, with it as happening. But while Whitehead is, is figuring that it is about revolutionary ideas that in the end kind of brought up a culminative effect that, that, that made it possible to overcome slavery as a basic presupposition, at least as that, not, not as a practice, but as a basic presupposition, he also says there has to be at the same time metaphysical discussion, uh, uh, a relevant metaphysical discussion, because otherwise the controversies would be superficial, would be stay uh, on sociologically, they would stay on the surface. And he calls that uh, we have to talk about some more fundamental determinations. And it's nice to see in Whitehead when he uses some terms, uh, they are undefined or they are defined, even if they are, if, even if they are defined, they are movable, they're kind of, uh, in a sense, uh, not clearly defined, which allows him to uh, kind of be that, that uh, avoiding that kind of uh, structure which is fixed in which something that is said is said. So when he talks about this, the more fundamental determinations, what he's talking about, and he's talking about actually what I would call a deconstruction of implicit abstractions. He, he, he names that the, the, the limitations, it's about talking about the limitations within which our intuition are are hashed. So it's about talking about making clear, making open, deconstruct the limitations in which we think. Like slavery is such a limitation of its in nature, uh, which is a precondition of our uh, thought. And this deconstructing of the undiscovered limitations, as he calls it, is actually then Whitehead's quest or question of ontology. So his question of ontology, as is true for Deleuze, is not a question of being of beings, although that, that re rhetoric can pop up as a class in the list, actually, at certain points. It's not about the interrelationships of beings insofar as they are, but it's about becoming or the conditions of becoming, which is also the conditions of novelty, 
conditions uh, to, to expand on or explode or unfold at different ways to put the, these kind of uh, limitations in which our intuitions are fetched. So it's not, it's actually not in this ontology about, uh, if it's about becoming, it's not about seeking the interpretation. It's not about seeking the interpretation of slavery. So how can we trade with that fact? It's not about that, but it is about an understanding that is already the outcome, always, of a creative synthesis of novelty beyond any state. So whenever you try to interpret something, you have gone beyond that state to the good or the bad, in a certain way, revolutionary or not. It is about the event, actually. That goes, goes beyond interpretation. Interpretation becomes only a retrospective way to analyze something. I see at least three metaphysical complications, and I use a similar term like you, it's complicity, it's complications in that, in that move of writing. And I want to put it uh, uh, in these terms. First one is, it seems to be that metaphysical principles in Whitehead ha exhibit a kind of distributive arbitrariness. They are not fixed, not fixed principles. So what can never be found in Whitehead is ontological reasons out of a state of things, a fixed thing. Uh, we always, he says, find only historical reasons for their pattern. So every day pattern, in fact, has only reasons that cannot be uh, grounded in an ontological structure which is already there, from which we just derived them. Uh, this is actually why it is ontological principle. So it's about ontology, but I always was curious, why did he call what he called ontological principle an ontological principle? Because it's precisely not an ontological principle. In a sense, it's not giving something it's not revealing a being of beings in the background, a ground of grounding. There is, it's precisely the opposite of it. He calls it, he names it, and, and as you know, uh, he changed his term from event to actual entities and used event for, for a combination of actual entities. But if you want to stay in that kind of uh, open texture, you can say what he said was that actual entities, so what he calls an ontological principle for his is that actual entities are the only reasons so that to search for a reason is to search for one or more actual entities. To search for a reason is to, to uh, search for events. The interesting point here is it's about reasons. It's not necessarily about causes. This is quite similar to Deleuze's differentiation coming out of a totally different context with his stoic uh, background and effects and causes. Um, but it is something, at least it is something that cannot be brought back to a substructure, a ground in which it's grounded. It's precisely prohibiting that there is something like that. It's only, always going back to, if you want, historical reasons or reasons of becoming or something, which has at a certain point also been different in by conflict here. <clears throat> so the demand, uh, uh, what it demands, this ontological principle, is actually that political agency is always only historically determined. It's not ontologically fixated. We cannot have an ontology out of which we can say that something has to happen, it can be described, yeah, uh, prescriptive, and so on. Cultural necessities have no ontological foundation. They're always going back to other cultural necessities, often, which are not foundations. So they are not just awaiting an interpretation so that we, you know, we can interpret that in the, in the sense of having a ground, but they are always already activities, they are always already events. So if you, you want to go back or forward, you always, you always end or begin or in the middle of events. You never find a ground out of which you can restate that in an ontological sense. And that would be his ontological uh, principle, which then is the basis for his uh, approach to um, politics of freedom and equality, uh, but also paradoxically, it allows them for the possibility of slavery at the same time. And, and I want to expand on that a little bit because that's the paradox uh, I'm wrestling with in writing the list. And uh, uh, the question is whether they can solve that problem. And I think ultimately they fail to do so, but there's a reason for that that they uh, fail. So that was the first point. The second point, the second complication here is Whitehead with, or against Hume actually, was not thinking what he says that there can be 
there can be no appeal to practice to supplement metaphysics. So you can't have one metaphysics, but you can say if it's not working, you have a practice on the other hand that, that you either accept or tolerate as not kind of uh, working together with it, or uh, that that uh, that you always in, invoke to, uh, to make interpretations work. But he says, and, and this is the point where he wants to go, or where he actually admires uh, Hume, uh, that the final appeal to practice is an appeal against the antiquity of metaphysical categories as interpretive of experience. So that the metaphysical categories actually are changing because of the fact, because of the event, you change the, the principles changing. They are not basic principles already fixed there with which you either interpret experience uh, or practice, or you say, well, it's a practice, but I've, I've, you know. I've, I've, the actual grounding, uh, I might not find a way to say that, how it's grounded, but it's still my principle. So there's a kind of empiricism there invited that does not interpret the practice in a sense that it then relates to a certain ontology, but if you want to go with the big words here, because he in, invited us to think about that the French Revolution thinks revolution. So revolutionary praxis might precisely, um, to be honest, uh, might be understood precisely as the praxis that cannot be based on any ontology. Maybe you can even say it's on each revolution creates its own ontology to its own disadvantage, actually, then. This implies also that uh, thinking of revolution demands also the analysis of an ontology in place, a so-called interpretation that allows a practice to happen and to be justified. So it is like, uh, if you want, Julie Butler, that invited that we find a radical criticism of substantialism as uh, a criticism, of, uh, as a deconstructive criticism of the reinterpretive enforcement of an ontology that justifies a practice such like, uh, or such as slavery. It's a deconstruction of these kind of certifications. And the third one, uh, very shortly, in a sense, for Whitehead, ontology and politics are mutually untimely. I use a term that's not used by Whitehead here, uh, but by Deleuze, meaning that they're either in their past or future of any given state to one another. They are not working together to, to, to become a communal presence in which they just you know, nicely work together and you can move from one to the other. They're never working together, actually, and that's precisely the point. They are becoming a presence for one another. Now these three complications of mutual, if you want, this kind of interface of mutual resonance of ontology and politics, which is not a resonance, it's not just a positive resonance, it's kind of one that also strikes one, one strikes the other here, uh, makes or renders feasible the paradox of democracy as he mentions, the, par the paradox is that it on the one hand might have been indeed the seed for, um, for overcoming slavery, so the seed for overcoming, but at the same time um, made it possible and lived on the possibility and on the reality of slavery. He calls it everyone in Athens, he means, going back to where it comes from, accepted slavery as a matter of cause. It was presupposed in the very structure of society, and such necessity limits the scope of all generalities. So what he's saying actually that whenever we want to you know, have an ontology of democracy, which is a nice multiplicity and everyone has a voice and we can talk to one another, it's only said because we have excluded already the slaves on which it is built. And that's what he is, uh, he is mentioning here. What it does is we think it's a universal thing. So we have a universal democracy, uh, the idea of a universal democracy. Everyone should be in a democracy, right? Uh, but it's already said in a context in which we have excluded or we are hedged in our intuitions already within this uh, limits of the scope of generalities. So the limit is given by slavery already. So if you go out and want to say, I want everyone to be in a democracy and we install a democracy, that's the point, that's the problem, we do precisely that. Yeah. We repeat the problem of building it again on the basis of slavery. For Whitehead, uh, actually he mentions that uh, there are two events in, 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 in uh, Greece that kind of uh, conspired to that democracy 
as, as a seat for overcoming slavery. And one of it, and again, both are based already, again, on <coughs> the slavery that happened. One for him is Pericles' Perry, uh, speech, uh, which allows everyone to talk freely in a society, kind of creating a public space of free talk. And free talk was not only talk, it was meant as political action at that point, or activity at that uh, time. And secondly, Plato's deeper notions, he says, from which all claims for freedom must spring, namely the psychic factors in the universe stressed as the source of all spontaneity. And as we might know or realize, uh, these psychic factors of spontaneity are not meaning an eternal, just an eternal existing uh, reality, so we, we kind of, uh, like uh, uh, beginning 20th century or, in, or mid, even middle 19th century, uh, because we have a totalitarian state, we have an internal psychic state in which we go back and we have our living room where we can be free, but outside we have to be very careful what we do, situation that comes back today, I think, in a certain sense. Uh, but it is a political notion. It means that it internally makes you able to be ethically, you know, politically active outside. Yeah, it's a kind of political public movement, it's not just an internal movement. In the, in the wake of these events, he says, there are essential elements of civilizations that uh, can only maintain free society. And uh, the disturbing thing of it is that what he mentions as that essential element in civilization is, he calls it the sense of the variousness of the universe, not to be fathomed by our intellects, which sounds that it was beyond the <coughs> principle of reason. Uh, it cannot be fathomed ever but it is the variousness that goes beyond. It's that blurredness, variousness that is a kind of multiplicity that cannot be pinned down to elements of unity or whatever. Uh, and this, if you want ontological structure of spontaneous multiplicity, then demands, he calls it this way, the duty of tolerance that is our finite homage to the abundance of inexhaustible novelty which is awaiting the future. So at the same time, inexhaustible novelty which cannot <coughs> ever be which, which is precisely the context in which all these hedged intuitions, these limitations are seen, but we never reach that point where we come to that infinity as a positive thing, where we kind of utter, this is also then the problem with democracy actually ever being without that problem of slavery. Uh, Whitehead's, one of Whitehead's consequences uh, uh, is that, or is radical in a sense, or was for him a radical, thing to say is, is if one you can say it's constructivism. It says that um, laws, whatever you want to call structure, whatever you want to call reason or ground, whatever, is imminent to becoming. It's not something that's outside, something before or whatever, or over uh, it's, or under. It's always an outcome of becoming. And therefore, what he says about it is that it is just a, cu a, a communal custom. So any law, any kind, and be it even mathematics, and be it even laws of logic, are to a certain extent communal customs of how things run. Law is, to a certain extent, therefore, you could say it's a term that, that was taken up by Julie Butler, performative. The events on which they are based crack open always the hidden multiplicities. They cannot never be pinned down to any certain order. And I think it was mentioned by the kind of radicals in Whitehead. <clears throat> The, the, the entire living nexus or the entire living uh, 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 occasions in freely through his society moving. But disturbing them, not just moving around. Um, so the event ever overcreates the law as a parody, realizing that there is no natural state of given things. There's no natural state. It would be a naturalization. It's nothing that's just, again, something that we have to present. Whitehead's ontological deconstruction of slavery is that of a subjection to a transcendent law politically utilized to create, well, it's a term that's not really fitting, but to create privileges, but it's more than a privilege. You hear more than that. It's not just a nice privilege. It's really that privilege that uh, is based on very profound uh, subjection of people. And uh, therefore is directed, so that the central point that he directs it against is his criticism of substantialism. And he calls uh, the, arise of, uh, the, the rise of slavery as the installment of a barbarian substratum in society. I quote it a little bit later more, so it's kind of uh, an outcome of his criticism of substantialism. For Whitehead, 
um, the same deception that led, it is the same deception that led to three expressions of substantialism, uh, and they are interrelated uh, again. So one is ontologically, if you want, Descartes, what he calls arbitrary disconnection of two kinds of substance, corporal and mental. They were not only reducing mentality to reflection and body to empty extension, uh, but justifying the privileges of mind over body, men over women, substance over attribute. Uh, in, uh, epistemologically, it leads to the bifurcation of nature by the isolation of entities from the web of interrelations of nature, reducing the fundamental character of nature, what he calls the metaphysical substratum of his properties. So it makes the kind of interconnection of events uh, to a passive material substratum of which these events become properties. That's the substantialization process. And precisely that is what he says about the political uh, complex, the third one, namely uh, uh, that slavery, the installation, what he calls, quote, the barbarous substratum interwoven in the social structure so as to sustain the civilized ethics. It's also the creation of that substratum of which then the, the, the subjects of it become properties. So the, 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 one of the consequences of this analysis is that we have to get rid of that notion of property uh, in his sections. When he calls Aristotle the one who was the apostle of substance and attribute, uh, that installed a kind of classificatory logic uh, of hierarchies of uh, then what we later will call um, binaries or privileging binaries, hierarchies that are already in, in place, which led to the justification also in Aristotle of slavery on the basis of the understanding that slaves are properties of substances, namely the free citizen. Mm -hmm. If slavery is the reduction of human beings to private property or economic asset, the reduction of self-created agency to passive particles of matter, then it is based on this substantialist disconnection. I want to end here that the white page. How much time do you have? So? Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, it happens not just to you, right? Uh, is I, I mentioned. I, so I skip forward, but I will mention one quote of White, which kind of mentions his other, his, his kind of alternative view to substantialize and then uh, uh, propertize things, uh, and, and mentions where he wants to go. Uh, quote. When philosophy hinges around the difficulty of describing the world in terms of subject and predicate, substance and quality, particular and universal, that results always, that result does always violence to that immediate experience which we express in our actions, our hopes, our sympathies, and our purposes, whereby we find ourselves in a buzzing world, I mean the democracy of fellow creatures, that's the quote I put on the front. Whereas under some disguise or other, orthodox philosophy can only introduce us to solitary substances. I'm going to skip to uh, uh, Deleuze, and since I have only four minutes left or something like this, let me uh, just mention two things which makes it uh, kind of interesting how he connects to it. One is that he also goes back at a certain point in his dialogues to, to Hume to make that difference between an ontology which is an ontology, an ontology which is no ontology, like Whitehead's uh, ontological principle, and he calls, it, calls the one the ontology of the is, and the, one, the other one of the end. The end, which is A-N-D, always in, in capitalized, in the sense that it's always the kind of addition that can now be uh, reckoned with, and it can now be come out of the is, while um, uh, this ontology of the is is precisely where that substantialism kicks in. In the end, it does not. It is now interesting, I have to skip Nietzsche here, and I have to skip Spinoza here, also, but just on the side. Um, they all make analysis of these, or both make analysis of Spinoza, for instance, to come to this point. And it's interesting, and I want to end with that, so, so that uh, most of the best things are not said, um, as everyone else says. Uh, there is a lecture. <laughs> There's a lecture of Spinoza in Versailles, December 12th, 1980. And it is, it is on Spinoza. And he is talking about the precise our question. He says, he asked the question, in what sense can ontology entail or must it entail a political philosophy? Well, he's actually asking that question. 
Right? And he rephrases it at a certain point with Spinoza asking that question that the others had already raised. Namely, not to understand just slavery, but to understand how it is possible that people fight for the slavery. Right? Be in that situation is proposed and propelled all the time. Uh, and he answers with a fundamental, he calls a fundamental relation between ontology and a certain style of politics. And he wants to differentiate that. If you situate, he says, a political philosophy in an ontology, then he would differentiate between what he calls pure ontologies and philosophies of the one. So we are back to the one. That's really the point. So let me end with that quote, which makes clear in which situation he si situates himself here. Then maybe one sentence more. The quote is, Philosophies of the one are philosophies that fundamentally imply a hierarchy of existing things. The problem of the state they will encounter is the institution of a political hierarchy. What appears to me striking in a pure ontology is the point at which it repudiates the hierarchies. In effect, if there is no one superior to being, being is said of everything, and that is, that is, and is said of everything that is in one and the same sense. Here, the criticism of Badiou kicks in that the one is still kind of present as the kind of enfoldment of the one. This world, he goes on to say, of ontological immanence is an essential, uh, is, is an essential anti hierarchical world. It is almost a kind of anarchy, and he uses the term in the original sense that you have no order out of which it, it comes. There is an anarchy of beings in being. Therefore, the political domain depends precisely on this kind of intuition of equal being, of anti-hierarchical being. Now, as I go on to explain later on, they, they try to, uh, both White and Deleuze, I think they try to make a point uh, that how can it be that you are saying there is that kind of ontological statement, which is not real ontological statement, that allows you to go in the direction of democracy. What, what, that's what Deleuze says. It goes in the direction of anti-hierarchical, which opens up that possibility. At the same time, how do we explain that slavery at the same time happens? And how, why can it be that, ha that slavery is, is all the time, at the same time, the basis, the, the excluded of that happening? And I think, ultimately, with all the strategies they use for becoming multiple, <coughs> becoming, becoming democratic, or becoming minor, in a certain sense, they fail to reach that point in which you can exclude precisely that duality. Uh, what, the interesting, what the interesting thing for me is, uh, at the end, is that uh, when, when he tries, for instance, with the body with the organs, it's precisely that cannot happen. It's a limit that you never reach. So it's precisely whenever you try, you become a totalizing movement, which is really the death of that, what you tried. That's the, the kind of the tragedy of, of that, and, and I think I understand, therefore, why White in Adventures of Ideas later on always talks about that tragedy. Yeah, that is in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Uh, our second speaker is so Henry Cripps, Professor of Cultural Studies and the Andrew W. Mellon, all Claremont Church Humanities at Claremont Graduate University. The talk, uh, the politics of Badio from absolute singularity to object. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll sit down. I, I have this prospect of the taller members of the speaking fraternity here bending over painfully the, uh, the rather short. Uh, so I'm going to try sitting down. And hopefully, uh, you, will, you will hear me with no trouble. I've certainly had no complaints over that my voice is not loud enough. So, um, the, the question which I want to I want to address is for Badiou, what is an event? Specifically, what is a political event? Uh, Badiou famously offers the example of the French Revolution. He starts by considering how one of his bugbears, the professional historian, would approach this event. And I quote: the historian ends up including in the event of the French Revolution, everything delivered by the epoch as traces and facts. The electors of the general estates, the peasants of the great fear, the saint lot, the soldiers of the draft, but also the price of subsistence, the guillotine, the effects of the tribunal, and so on. But this archival approach, Badiou says, may well lead to the one 
the unity of the event being undone, swamped by the forever infinite and endless numbering of the gestures, things and words that coexisted with it. Badiou then affirms that the French Revolution deserves to be singled out as a proper event only in so far as there exists, and I quote again, a halting point for this potentially infinite dissemination. Specifically, an event is constituted through what Badiou calls an interpretive intervention by which the conscience of the times and the retroactive intervention of our own time filters the entire site through the one unifying principle of its eventual qualification. So the question is, what form does this interpretive intervention take? According to Badiou, it involves discerning a new pattern within the nexus of effects that are connected with the event. So you look to the future. Thus, the interpretive intervention operates via a sort of gestalt switch whereby an unrecognized collection of effects, what Badiou calls an excrescence, is transformed into what he calls a normal element of the situation, which is both presented as an element in its own right, but also represented as a part. This interpretive intervention then retrospectively hypostasizes the event as the source of this new pattern of events. And I quote, an interpretive intervention declares that an event is present in a situation as the arrival in being of non-being, the arrival amidst the visible of the invisible. So you, you have this image of the French Revolution, this endless dissemination of effects and, and facts, and uh, into the midst of this, it, there is an arrival of the revolution, retrospectively in terms of a pattern which is discerned in terms of the, the endlessly disseminating field of uh, effects. An element that is a sort of special sort of singularity, what Badiou calls an absolute singularity, that is distinct from the endlessly disseminating elements that the historian offers as candidates for inclusion in the revolution. More specifically, the event is like a secret heart of the revolution, which lies hidden in the midst of, but separate from, the disseminating field of facts and traces that the historian describes. Note, however, that the process of discerning a new pattern that precipitates the emergence of the event of the revolution <coughs> is not merely a matter of an academic historian years later discovering what existed all along that was hidden. Instead, the process of discerning is also contemporary with the event, an action by the participants themselves, which rather than cognitive in nature, rather than just discovering, oh my God, we're on the crest of a revolution, uh, is a militant commitment to seeing and acting upon things differently. For example, consider the way in which the light of the interpretation of the French Revolution as revolution, as a revolution, uh, in, sorry, consider the way in which in the light of the interpretation of the French Revolution as a revolution, the mass of peasants who are part of the situation in France, 1789 to 1790, retrospectively becomes a new entity namely those what, what Badiou calls the peasants of the great fear who seize the castles, a happening that together with other happenings such as the storming of the Bastille constitutes a diffuse and somewhat indeterminate source for the effects that are connected to the revolution as its future traces. In this case, it is clear that the relation between the event and its effects is not merely a matter of straightforward causation, but instead involves a retroactive dimension, had in exactly Freud's sense. That is, through an interpretive intervention that occurs after the fact, as it were, the event is brought into being as a point of origin for the new pattern of effects. Now, whether this is nominalism is, of course, one of the interesting questions that uh, James Bradley's uh, talk raised. 
But as I indicated, the interpretive act also takes place at the site of the event itself. For example, through the actions of the participants who are signing on to the cause under one of its many names, liberty, revolution, down with tyranny, and so on, bring it into existence. Thus, their acts in identifying with the cause take on what we may think of as a performative dimension, not merely an interpretive dimension. Furthermore, their signing on functions not merely as a cause, but also for Badiou critically as a part of the event, thus collapsing the distinction between saying the name and conjuring up the object, or in Lacan's terms, there is no meta-language. The language-meta-language distinction collapses. To put it in a nutshell, the act of interpretation through which the event is retrospectively brought into being itself becomes part of the event. Thus, the event is doubled. It manifests both as an absolute singularity, as well as the act of interpretation <coughs> through which the event is named by those who are faithful to it. As Badiou puts it, the mark of itself belongs to the eventual multiple. Badiou offers a compelling account of the event, and I, I, I can only, I've only given a very, the briefest summary here of it. But as Oliver and Justin pointed out yesterday, there is a serious weakness in this account Namely, its failure to detail the connection between an event and its material surroundings, the situation in which it appears. In the next section, I'm going to use some Lacanian concepts to address this weakness. Then in the final section, I'm going to turn finally to Badiou's concept of the political uh, event by talking a little bit about uh, Zizek. So, the next section is called Badiou and Lacan. Badiou explores the concept of an event in a variety of contexts, including the one that I focus on here, namely Nietzsche's critique of St. Paul's account of the Christ event, namely the resurrection. According to Nietzsche, Paul insists that in order to understand the revolutionary significance of the passion of Christ, there must be something in addition to the blunt facts of the death by crucifixion of a man, Jesus of Nazareth, even when those facts are thickened with theological meaning, namely Jesus as also the Son of God, the maker of miracles, and so on. That something in addition, Nietzsche claims, is the resurrection with its universal invitation to have faith and thus find salvation. An invitation that is universal in the sense that it cuts across, as Badiou puts it, all social barriers, extending to Greek and to Jew alike. Nietzsche then dismisses this invitation as the big lie of the resurrection, with its phony promise of salvation. There is, says Nietzsche, nothing more to the resurrection than the crucifixion, if indeed there is even that, all the rest is a comfortable, or perhaps not so comfortable, if you happen to be Jewish as I am, uh, not so comfortable fable. But you object that Nietzsche misunderstands Paul's position. Paul, the cynical rabbi, recognized well enough that the situation of the crucifixion contained no secret, let alone mystical something in addition, which transformed the crucifixion into the resurrection, and correspondingly grounded the faith in salvation. On the contrary, the dimension of faith presupposes precisely the absence of any such grounding element. Instead, Badiou argues, the resurrection presented itself in the situation of the crucifixion as a basic element, an absolute singularity, rather than being a composite of the crucifixion together with some mystery element, some mystery secret ingredient, X. But you makes the point like this. But Nietzsche is not precise enough. When he writes that Paul needs Christ's death and something in addition, he should have emphasized that this something is not in addition to the death. He then goes on to say that if Paul 
shifted the center of gravity of Christ's existence beyond the experience of the crucifixion, then it is in accordance with the principle that because of the crucifixion, life, affirmative life, is restored and refounded for all." End of quote. How then does the resurrection come to appear as an absolute singularity, independent of, but attached to, the crucifixion? Where does it come from? From the future, Bud, you argue, <coughs> as a retroactive effect of a process of fidelity by subjects who are defined by their faith in and faithfulness to the resurrection, along with their related hope for salvation. In short, to put it in quasi-Nietzschean terms that suits Badiou's atheism, the event of the resurrection is the result of a sort of wish fulfillment which fastens onto the crucifixion as a fictional basis for the hope of salvation. Thus, we can see Badiou distinguishes three aspects of the Christ event. One, plain material facts of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth, what Clifford Geertz would call a thin description, relatively unmediated by heavy theoretical or theological vocabulary. Two, the death on the cross of Christ, Son of God. But three, the process of fidelity to the resurrection, which constitutes it retroactively via an interpretive intervention. Badiou designates the second of these aspects, namely the death of Christ, as the absolute singularity that constitutes what he sometimes also calls the eventual site, and designates the third aspect, namely the resurrection, as the event proper. Now, Badiou has a lot to say about the relation between these latter two aspects of the event. In particular, he emphasizes that the eventual site does not determine the event. On the contrary, the event is determined by the intervention of militant subjects who bridge the gap between the eventual site and the event. Or to turn the point around, the gap between event and eventual site creates a space for the militant subject and his or her exercises of fidelity. In Althusserian terms, we may say that this gap is the ideological site of interpolation, where individuals, all of them, are called, and some of them, although not as many as nine out of 10, uh, Althusser's uh, speculative figure, manage to <coughs> prove themselves as true militant subjects. But Badiou has much less to say this is coming to my point of criticism of Badiou, much less to say about the equally important relation between the first of the above three aspects of the Christ event, namely the mundane happening of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth, and the second of the aspects, namely the fictionalized death of the Christ. In particular, he offers no way of thinking why in the biblical context the fable of the crucifixion of the Son of God is attached to the account of a botched execution of a man, Jesus of Nazareth, that is so full of strange and gruesome details. The premature darkness, the strangely restless animals, the stumbles by the criminal on his way to execution, the unruly mob, the sympathetic soldiers, the preternaturally delayed death, and so on. I want to suggest that we think the relation between these two stories in Lacanian terms. To be specific, I suggest we think of Christ's crucifixion and the botched death of Jesus of Nazareth as two different but necessarily coexisting manifestations of the same object, of what Lacan calls the objet petit a. What is the objet petit a? According to Lacan, it is the object which, by blocking access to the object of desire, is the cause of desiring. But it's also the object of the drive around which the subject circulates pleasurably in its failed attempts to get what it desires. According to Lacan, the objet petit a manifests in three intertwined levels or registers, which always and already coexist. First, the real, 
capital R real, namely the level at which the symbolic matrix falls apart, second, the imaginary, the, namely the level of fantasy, and third, the symbolic, namely the level of reality as it is represented. To be specific, the object PDR manifests at an imaginary level as a fantasy object, <coughs> the secret kernel or essence that belongs to the situation more than any of its concrete elements, the secret heart of the situation. Not as something we desire, but rather as an imagined stumbling block that we must but cannot get around if we are ever to get what we want. It also manifests the level of the symbolic as a denizen of reality, and in particular as what Lacan describes as the little piece of shit in the corner, the waste or surplus of a situation that retains a fragile purchase on reality by being banished to the recycle bin. I always think of my computer where all my important work always seems to end up in the recycle bin. I don't avoid stepping on it once it's there, I try to get it back, but it never returns, I'm afraid. <laughs> Finally, at the level of the real, the objet petit a manifests as a messy, shameful, anxiety-provoking, bizarre misfit in relation to the normative categories of the symbolic, a place where reality itself palpably stumbles and fails. In this light, then, how can we think the relation between the biblical account of the death of Jesus and the theologically supercharged account of the death of Christ? I suggest that we think of the death of Christ as an objet pertinent in its manifestation as an imaginary fantasy object, specifically as that which points the way to what the faithful hope for and desire, namely salvation, even as it marks out the way as perilous and difficult, even impossible. More than passing through the eye of a needle, a crossing from one side of the valley of death to the other. I love this biblical language. Uh, <laughs> this in turn suggests that the death of Jesus of Nazareth that the Gospels recount, namely a shameful and messy botched edu uh, execution, I think said education, <laughs> that was a Lacanian slip for you. <laughs> Whereas the Nietzschean version of the crucifixion, uh, a carpenter cruelly executed for his outlandish beliefs, is a manifestation of the same objet petit art in the symbolic register. We are thus able to explain the coexistence of the three stories of the crucifixion as accounts of one and the same objet petit art as it manifests in three different registers of the imaginary, the real, and the symbolic. This Lacanian suggestion throws light on the status of the death of Christ as an absolute singularity for Badiou. According to Lacan, the objet petit is what he calls an extimate object, by which he means that although it is intimate in the sense that it is more in the situation than the situation itself, its secret heart, it is also radically externalized, and in particular, embodied a totally banal, unworthy object. If then, as I suggest, the death of Christ is an objet art, we can see why it has, in Badiou's terms, no elements. It's because, as an extimate object, its elements are externalized. In other words, it takes on the topology of the Klein bottle. Its insides are turned outside, so that it no longer contains them in the sense that they are elements that belong to it. In Badiou's terms, the death of Christ becomes an absolute singularity, an element of the situation that is basic in the sense that it has no elements of its own. In the larger version of this paper, I show how this Lacanian reworking of Badiou's analysis of the event has consequences for what he calls political events, and in particular brings Badiou's concept of politics closer to the Lacanian concept of the tra traversal of the fantasy and identification with the Santonge. But I have neither the time nor the energy to include this here today. Instead, I want to content myself in conclusion with examining Zizek's suggestion for reworking Badiou's concept of the political along Lacanian lines a reworking that is of interest because it represents a 
common misreading of Badiou. As we will see, this brings up the vexed issue of naming in Badiou, to which Oliver and Justin gestured yesterday. So, final section, the Zizekian coda, what's in a name? Zizek sticks to Badiou's early emphasis on a politics of naming. Unlike Badiou, and more like Ernesto Leclau, he hypothesizes an identity between what Badiou calls names and what Lacan calls master signifiers, point du capitaine. On this basis, Zizek proposes a politics that involves the, quote, intervention of a master signifier that imposes a principle of ordering onto the world. The master invents a new signifier, which again stabilizes the situation and makes it readable. The master adds no new positive content, he merely adds a signifier, which all of a sudden turns disorder into order. In short, as Zizek also puts it, the task for an emancipatory politics today is to form a new world to propose new master signifiers that would provide new cognitive mappings, end of quote. But there seems to be something perversely, even dangerously wrong with Zizek's politics here. Consider, for example, the feminist political gesture that constitutes the social category of woman. Such a gesture definitely does not depend upon the authority of a feminist master, even one who acquires her authority retrospectively. On the contrary, as many feminists would be quick to point out, a feminist master is an oxymoron, since it reproduces exactly the patriarchal structure of mastery to which feminism is opposed. How then is the feminist political gesture to be achieved if not by an act of mastery, as Zizek would claim, undertaken from a position of authority, real or imagined? But Jew's answer to this question indicates the distance between his position and Zizek's. For Badiou, a political event must satisfy three conditions. First condition, its agents, what Badiou calls its subjects, must make an ongoing commitment to a new order. In particular, they must discern and remain faithful to a previously indiscernible pattern within the ever-expanding field of effects of the event, bringing the visible, the invisible, into the midst of the visible. In retrospect, then, the source of the newly discerned pattern of effects takes on the status of an absolutely singular element within the situation. Second condition, by cutting across the social boundaries that constrain people's activities, the new order operates according to a principle of eradicating inequality, to which um, uh, Roland just uh, gestured. Third condition, the event is democratic in the sense that rather than recruiting individuals from special interest groups whose interests it serves, it is open to all, that the Pauline gesture of offering salvation to all, whether Greek or Jew. For example, consider a case to which Jacques Ancière draws attention. The radical gesture by Jeanne de Rouen, who stood for legislative election in France at a time, 1849, when women were not legally permitted to be candidates. From Badiou's perspective, this gesture counts as an event, in particular a political event, insofar as subjects in general, men and women, Greek and Jew, interpret and remain faithful to it as a source for a previously indiscernible pattern of effects, which rather than merely advancing the cause of women, breaks down the social boundaries that create inequality. In other words, Derouin's gesture retrospectively takes on the mantle of a political event through the action of militants who in the name of equality remain faithful to it through a series of contingencies, setbacks, diversions, etc., which take it in wholly unexpected, unpredictable, even senseless directions. The danger, of course, is that such fidelity to the event runs out of steam, with the result the spirit of the initial gesture disseminates. Or worse, the gesture itself becomes absolutized, its effects predictable and listed encyclopedically, in which case, to use Rancière's terms, the political impulse reduces to mere policing. It follows that in its very conception, the political is irremediably fragile, ephemeral, always and already in need of renewal through the action of the faithful. 
Thus, contrary to Zizek's claim, it is clear that for Badiou, the political event does not involve the authoritative introduction of a new master signifier, let alone an intervention by a master in any sort of conventional totalitarian sense of the term. On the contrary, such events are a matter of an always and already open, thoughtful, and in particular self-critical engagement with the present, which seeks to preserve the event, even as, in response to contingencies, diversions, and setbacks, the future takes it in new directions that defy any attempt to master its unfolding, thereby continually facing militants who sign on to the event with the challenge of renewing. It is clear that these militants, these political agents, are nothing like masters in Lacan's sense. Instead, they are close to what Foucault calls particular intellectuals, whom he, Foucault, envisages in the following terms. I dream of the intellectual destroyer of universalities, the one who, in the inertias and constraints of the present, locates and marks the weak points, the openings, the lines of force, who incessantly displaces himself, doesn't know exactly where he is heading, nor what he'll think tomorrow, because he's too attentive to the present. But you differ from Foucault, then, in emphasizing that as political subjects, such particular intellectuals destroy universalities only as a prelude to the discernment and renewal of a new ordering of equality and justice. Thank you very much.